What an amazing organization, what an amazing human being and group of people that run Riot. We're thrilled uh, to have the partnership and just even beyond the partnership, the friendship, to be quite frank. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. What an incredible day. Well, day one for me, I guess it's day three for many of you at the uh, tent, all things open. As I said this morning, this is, uh, you know, kind of bar none, my favorite conference of the year. It is the best run conference, in my opinion. It is the most inclusive and diverse uh, conference in tech for certain. And uh, we're so pleased to be in our eighth year of partnering uh, with All Things Open with something that we call IoT Demo Night. And that's going to start about 6 o'clock downstairs. Uh, you can go back and forth from the front patio where All Things Open Social is down to where our social is. There's food and drinks, I think, at both of them. We have a bunch of startup companies and, and uh, folks that are, are doing some cool stuff where you can interact with them, and I'll explain that in a moment. But um, what we're going to do right now is a little bit experimental. So first, uh, if you don't mind putting my slides up, I'm going to just give a quick introduction of who we are, and then we're going to run a game show. We've never done this before. We're excited about it, but our goal is potentially to give away two jobs tonight. And so, first of all, welcome. Thank you for, for hanging out here with us for a few minutes this evening. I'm Tom Snyder. I founded Riot back in 2014, along with a couple of other collaborators. I'm going to talk about one of my co-founders here in a moment. Um, our goal is job creation and economic development and creating vibrant communities. And through most of our history, and we've grown quite a bit, uh, we're operating on a national basis. Once upon a time, we were the Raleigh Internet of Things. That's where Riot came from. We were a meetup group. Uh, but we're, we're a nonprofit organization operating around the country. We run startup accelerators. We do a lot of convening, hold about 70 events per year, lots of, uh, of different activities. This will be our first game show tonight. Um, but, but everything is focused around how do we create a more inclusive economy? How do we pay, help people to move uh, kind of up the wealth ladder through small business ownership, through creating new tech startups and, and growing? Um, and we work with a huge number of corporate partners that, that make this all possible. If you want to uh, promote some of the things we're doing this evening, we've got hashtag IoT Demo Night. There's ways to contact us. But as I mentioned, there's almost 100 corporate partners that provide funding on an annual basis to Riot. And I'd be happy to talk to anyone in here whose logo is not on the screen. Uh, but but the, for those that are, please, please thank them. Many of them are here this evening exhibiting down in the mezzanine level and uh, across all things open. They enable us to provide completely free resources to aspiring entrepreneurs. And many of those companies also leverage our programs on their own internal innovation programs and studies, which is exciting. There's one company that I really want to call out this evening, DNA Group. Uh, this is an organization, if you need anything made, and, and it, we're talking in tech space, so you know, elect, electronics, pa electronic packaging, circuit boards, other kinds of things, this organization can help figure out the right way to get that done, help you know, pull it all together. They have been a great partner for Riot for many years, and they, this evening, have taken what I think is the coveted sponsorship, the beer sponsor, uh, but, but even more than that, they've enabled uh, a lot of uh, free food and drink that'll be happening downstairs. I think we got three kegs this evening from a local craft brewery called Trophy, um, but make sure to stop by and talk to the DNA Group team. Uh, they're wonderful partners. Um, but why we're here is that the world is becoming increasingly connected through what we called IoT, and now we really think of as the data economy. We are automating every market vertical. We see you know, obvious uh, efforts in things like autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, self-flying drones, things that are automated in that space. Think about, we used to go to the doctor maybe twice a year. We had two data points to manage our health, right? Now we can do, you know, with an Apple Watch or other connected device, we can do persistent health monitoring, we can automate our ability you know, to take care of ourselves in better ways. And we're seeing this with uh, you know, the digital electric grid, we're seeing it in smart agriculture, we're seeing it in smart cities, anything with smart in it, one day we're gonna like, just call it a watch again, right? But, but right now that's kind of this data economy and, and this automation, and it creates huge opportunity. But we're in this interesting point where we've just come out of a pandemic, there's a lot of concern and worry that we might be in the face of a recession, right? Interest rates are going up, companies are starting to lay employees off at the same time that they have thousands of job openings, you know, millions of job openings 
across the United States. And on the labor side of things, there's it's been this great resignation, right? A lot of people have said, I want to do something more meaningful. I want to find a new career. For many folks that have not worked in tech, the question is, are there ways to get into tech? And what I would challenge is for the technology companies here that are hiring, maybe there's a large swath of the population that isn't getting the consideration that they should for some of the opportunities that, uh, that you have in some of the jobs that are available in the country. And so how do we make this connection? Lots of people looking for work, lots of employers looking for talent, and yet the common discourse is always, we can't find the talent that we're looking for, right? And maybe it's because we need to change the lens a little bit. And I'm happy to announce that, you know, the world is hiring. There is not a day goes by I don't have companies reach out saying, hey, I'm looking for XYZ. Who do you know in the Riot Network? And we try and make those connections. But we're not a recruiting organization. So we, we, we thought recently, startup accelerators, entrepreneurial support, as I said, that's helping people through small business ownership to move up the wealth ladder. But a lot of people just need to start by moving up the income ladder. How do you help people to build the digital skills that your organizations need? And so we have two programs I'm happy to announce, uh, funded by American Rescue Plan funding. One is in Wake Forest, North Carolina, just about a half hour north of here. Uh, and we've just signed a, a project in Wilmington, North Carolina, where we're going into lower income census districts. We're going into more rural parts of, of, of counties and other areas, folks who maybe haven't had all the resources that you have in a downtown Raleigh or a Research Triangle Park. And looking at the three and a half million middle skill jobs, what, uh, and that's not my term, but it, a term that's being used for, for jobs that don't require a college diploma, but they require a certain software certification of some kind, whether that's a Salesforce cert, a Cisco cert, Google, Cisco, like all the big uh, you know, companies have these, you know, kind of these online courses that you can find and other kind of curriculum, but there's an awful lot of communities that, that, that aren't ready just to even access that much. And so we've got a digital bridge program where we're going to these communities, helping to train them up. And then the goal is many of the kinds of jobs that, uh, you know, a graphic artist, for instance, once they know a particular piece of software can, can do a craft or somebody can manage a call center or they can be an IT system administrator, there's lots of jobs that we can get people in in six to 12 months of training. And this is a completely free program for the community, but the call to action is we're looking for companies that will job, that you'll post jobs on a business process outsourcing platform we have where we can train people specifically to your job and make that connection. We are looking for folks that want to volunteer to mentor and to coach into programs that have uh, you know, certification curriculum that we can put into the learning management system. Uh, this is really an effort. Uh, there's so much focus on you know, DEI. How, how do we bring a more diverse workforce? Well, a lot of that diversity is not in the places where you're recruiting today. Let, let, let us help you to do that. Uh, so that's something that we're passionate about. Really just wanted to kind of do that as an announcement of a program that we're working on. And I'll invite you to come to our right booth or uh, come to speak to us afterwards if, if you or your organization wants to get engaged. But tonight, we're going to look at a, kind of maybe the more traditional job that you might be thinking of if you're looking to hire, you know, software developers, technical sales, other kinds of folks. And, uh, and we're going to run an experiment. experiment. We've got three brave companies that are all involved in some way or another in, in engineering software consultant work where they you know, do client work for others. And we've got a couple of talented candidates that are open to maybe a, a new job opportunity. And we're going to see if we can't make a match. And so let me first introduce our, our panelists to or our three companies to come up and I'll introduce them. And while we do this, I'm going to pull a couple of chairs up on stage. All right, welcome, welcome. And so we are gonna start, uh, let's see, let's start at the far end of the row, Chris Lamb, Device Solutions. Chris, um, tell us who, who you are, a little bit about your company, and why you're here this evening. Good evening, Tom, okay. Managed to start the meeting without being on mute, so that's a good start. Uh, welcome, everybody, thanks for having us. I'm Chris Lamb, the CEO and co-founder at Device Solutions. We're a team of uh, 40 embedded engineers and developing embedded products for 20 years now. And uh, we develop the guts of the things in the, in, in the Internet of Things. So we're the ones who make them work. We have deep 
and long experience with radios and antennas. We're always looking for people to help us deliver products and prototype for our customers. Hardware, software, all over the map, right? Yeah, uh, tell, hardware tell us a little software. bit about what kind of clients you look for. Mostly the ones who can pay. <laughs> all right, do we have any Let's, out here who have some money? That's right, yeah. Those are the most important ones, but we really Perfect. do embedded work. So we're not doing the cloud, we're not doing the server and app. We're focusing on the things, the devices themselves. Right, and, and just quickly, like, what does day-to-day -day look like for folks in your organization? Day-to-day -day is hands-on with devices. So we're gonna give you a, either a dev board or a prototype, and we're either debugging it, throwing the schematics behind it, or writing the software running on it, cool. trying to meet well, the customer requirements. Awesome, welcome to the Big Job Contest. The first, uh, hopefully, of many. We'll see how this goes. Amy, yes. welcome to the program. Tell us who Amy Baldwin is and about Acceleration. Absolutely. I'm Amy. I'm from Acceleration. We're fairly new to the Raleigh area. We're a software consultancy. However, our mission is to educate developing engineers. Engineers who are still learning, whether they're undergrads or perhaps they're changing careers. So we have lead, senior, mentor engineers on our development teams, junior, mid, and learners. And they all work for our clients. So our learners, up to our senior mentors, are working directly with our clients. I have seen more students this year at ATO than any other year, which is incredible. Tell us how you kind of like heard, heard the cats and uh, create great outcomes for your clients. Absolutely. We heard the cats by being the number two internship in the country. I won't say who we're behind because I think they're here. But <laughs> our clients come to us because we offer a cost value for sure because our blended rate is lower. but they also get a pipeline that could possibly last for years because our students stay with us longer than three months. Sometimes we have them for three and a half years because they want to stay. That's what we do. And then some of them move on to the client when they graduate or they stay with you? Yes, they move on to the West Coast or wherever they want to go, DC. They get tired of the traffic and about five years later they call us and go, doo -doo 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 -doo. hey, do you have a job? <laughs> And they get to come back. We've uh, experienced that a couple times. We've also worked for one of our graduates who is a CTO. And they came back and hired us. So it's a great program. We've been running for about 12 years now. Fantastic. Welcome to the Big Job Contest. Thank you. All right. And Nick Jordan, to wrap us up with smashing boxes. I apologize. Sure. Looks like I hit backwards there. There you are. Okay, thanks. Hey, I'm Nick Jordan. I'm an entrepreneur uh, in the Raleigh-Durham area. I own a software development agency called Smashing Boxes. Uh, two years ago, we also spun out a venture studio called SB Ventures, and I also do some local angel investing as well. So I'm excited to be here because talent is one of our most important resources that we bring to bear um, in terms of our company, but it's also one of the most important resources that any company, startup, and or otherwise uh, can leverage uh, for their future success. So you definitely, the, you know, the company name implies a certain culture, the, the, the client projects come out in one piece at the end, right? So mm -hmm. tell us how you work differently. Sometimes. Um, well, I think we say that our DNA is entrepreneurial spirit. And to us, that means that every problem is an opportunity. And therefore, there are no constraints, right? So we, you know, inside of the box, outside of the box, or are you smashing the box? So when you first realize that there are no constraints, you're free to think creatively about how you're going to solve a problem. And, you know, to kind of preempt some of the other ones in terms of day in the life. Sometimes it's very straightforward and it's, here's my daily stand up, here's my commit, here's my client meeting. Other times we're walking into situations where there's just a big bad problem or a big market opportunity and we need to use our brain power to solve it and then our tools and our skills in terms of you know design and engineering. All right, well, welcome to the big job contest. Uh, to kind of get us started before we bring our contestants on stage, uh, each of these companies we met with ahead of the program, they are looking for a variety of kinds of skills and, and talents. So the, our two contestants this evening come from a little bit different background. We'll get to know them in just a moment. Uh, our companies, you know, we came together, came up with a list of questions that, that we're gonna ask. And in order to do that, we need the other half of the hiring equation. So I'm gonna ask Brandon Mathis and Carly Pavlinak to come up on stage, please. All right, these are a couple of brave souls right here. Let's give a round of applause for them and for our companies. All right, so uh, you can, uh, you have your choice actually. You can grab the podium or the handheld as you prefer, but Brandon, let's start with you. Uh, just quick introduction of your, yourself, a little bit of your background. <clears throat> yeah, check, okay, cool. 
Um, yeah, I feel pretty comfortable just standing here, not behind the podium, so All I right. think I'm good. Um, uh, yeah, Brandon Mathis, I'm a freelance full-stack developer. Uh, live here in the Raleigh, North Carolina area. I've had the privilege to work with a lot of different companies, both large and small, in varying different industries and in varying different capacities and um, uh, things of that matter. Particular stack I specialize in from a technology standpoint is, oh, I need to hold this closer to my mouth, okay. Uh, typical technologies I mostly specialize in is React, React.js, all things React, and Ruby on Rails. So React Native, React on the web, Ruby on Rails backend, stuff like that. Building software, that's me. Cool, so we're gonna get to know you a little bit better in a moment to, from a job perspective. Tell us something about yourself you would not reveal in a job interview. Um, wow. <laughs> something about myself that I would not reveal in a job interview. Um, holy crap, it's man. Not an interview, I mean, I'm this such is a contest. A, honestly, I'm, I'm an open book of an individual. <laughs> I did not prep him for that question. <laughs> I don't hold anything back. I'm really honest with people in a job interview because I expect for them to be honest to me right back. And if I'm holding something back, then I'm creating an environment where they could be holding something back. And I don't want to be interviewed in a scenario like that. So. Um, I don't really have an answer to that, man. I don't hold anything back. That, I'm that, all in. That's all right. He's all in. That's why he's on stage this evening, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you very much. Uh, Carly, we introduce you uh, quickly, and then we'll jump into the question. So please. Hi, everybody. My name is Carly Pavlinak Blackburn, and I am a digital brand marketing manager. Um, previously a startup founder, um, created a company, a fitness app for celebrity trainers to monetize their social media following. Um, raised venture capital funding all the way to acquisition and then worked at the company that acquired us and then a marketing agency and now I'm here. Very cool. So it, one of the things that they don't tell you in the entrepreneurial space is when your company gets acquired by somebody else, you maybe can work for someone else's company or you can be unemployed. Yes. Right? So that's where I'm at now, <laughs> looking for a job. Wonderful. Well, thank you for being here as well. Brandon, we're going to start with you. Uh, as I said, we, we have four questions that we're going to ask. These are All questions right. that we, we brought together as a group. And uh, as he answers, if you have any reactions, please share them uh, from our corporate panelists here. But the first question is, what is the most creative method that you have used to reach a new client? Um, you know, that's an interesting question because, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I guess I have interesting answers to every question you could ask. <laughs> But um, as a tech person, I live in a little bit of a bubble where there's so many opportunities, especially for someone with experience, so many opportunities out there that, you know, for me, it's really a matter of attracting the right opportunities and the opportunities that fit for me. So I would say the most interesting technique that I've used is to kind of just fundamentally change the way that I engage with the community at large and always think of myself as kind of being on a stage and selling myself and selling my skill sets and also keeping, you know, I'm a, that selling part a little limited in so I can hear what other people have to offer because I'm always out there on the hunt looking for like the next cool fit, the next interesting project, you know, someone who's working in something that I've never seen before or something that I've already, you know, always had a desire to get experience with. Um, so it's, it's not a tactic that I've ever engaged on one specific thing, you know, apart from typical crank all night on an RFP, you know, response and a collated deck with a cool cover letter, you know, and stuff like that. But literally just kind of changing the way that I operate in the community at large and getting as engaged as I possibly can. Very nice. So scale of one to 10 from the panelists, how comfortable are you with really non-traditional sales methods? 10. I see a 10, Chris. Eight, 10, all right. We have yes, some risk takers. That's, score. <laughs> that's great, fantastic. All right, second question. What is the best way for, to stay on top of technology or to solve a technical challenge you haven't found before? Hmm. Well, I mean, the best way to stay on top of technology is you're doing it right here now, in my opinion. I mean, you, you have to come to events like this. You have to engage with the community and not just watch YouTube tutorials online and read books, you know, you're only going to get so far with that. You need to get out there into the community and understand what it is that people are using in the real world and what their successes have been with that and what failures they've experienced with that so that you can avoid those same pitfalls. Um, in, 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 in terms of how I approach a problem that I've never encountered before, 
I try to seek out a professional human who has encountered that error before. If I can't find someone who's never encountered this before, then that means I'm kind of in the territory of invention and maybe creating something that no one has ever seen before, no one's ever solved before. So I really just dive into the deep end all the way. Don't even ease in. Just just get all the way into the problem as hard as you can and make a bunch of mistakes. So and, uh, a yeah. place like All Things Open where you can meet collaborators, open source Absolutely. support. Yeah, that's fantastic. Absolutely. What's an area of emerging technology that like is new that you're really looking for in your companies? Ooh. Do they want to jump in? I'm, I'm asking the panel first. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, we're doing you know more and more processing and machine learning at the edge, which is a challenge because you don't have the data set to do the training or the horsepower to do the learning. So. Yep. Fantastic. Nick? Amy? I'd say the same, just kind of thinking about um, what is the future of AI and how do we create empathy through that process and who is an expert and who's not, and it's all fairly subjective seemingly. So yeah. uh, thinking through that with talented team members is important. Awesome. Anything you want to add? We have a really great problem that when our clients come to us, we get to work on what their vision is and what they're wanting to do. So I think we get the, we get the, the unique things coming to us, which works for us. <laughs> we don't have to go searching. Awesome, awesome. All right. Third question, you're halfway there. Describe for us a past project that you're particularly proud of and why. Um, there's a few that I'm particularly proud of, but there's one in particular that comes to mind where I really feel like I made a big impact in um, uh, some people's lives. And that was, I, I was working on a medical application, actually it was in partnership with Nick over here at Smashing Boxes. Um, a while back, and it was in. Um, uh, it was directed at the Dana Farber Cancer Research Institute. It was a web application that integrated with individuals' Fitbits and other medical mo or um, uh, other you know personal medical monitoring devices. I guess you could call Fitbit that maybe, but it integrated with all these cool systems to kind of measure and track activity and you know track people's uh, physical health, what they ate, what their diet was, and things like that. Um, uh, post cancer treatment specifically as it pertains to breast cancer. And it was, it, was, it was really cool getting to work with all these modern integrations from a tech standpoint, and also like knowing that deep down, this is something that is really gonna make, I mean, a really positive impact out there in society. That was cool. Very cool, very cool. All right, do we have any Riot Underground listeners in the audience? See a few hands up. So we have a podcast called the Riot Underground, and every guest that comes on the podcast that's this fourth question that's coming to you, which is uh, a podcast is an audio only production. Here you get to see who's on stage, but we ask if you could cast yourself in the biopic about your life, or is it biopic? I never know if it's, anyway, who would you cast to play Brandon Mathis and why? Hmm, well, I feel like I give the obvious answer of I, I'd play myself, but um, if I had to give a straight up Aspiring answer, actor. right, I know, <laughs> it's a little conceited, but if I had to pick somebody, I would say I would pick someone with, you know, a similar personality, you know, physical build, look, and general outlaw talk towards life, so probably Channing Tatum, I'd say. Channing yeah. Tatum, Definitely. all right, yeah. all right. I thought you were going to say Christian Bale, but. Mm, yeah. that, that, right. It's close, it's close, right. yeah. And who would play Smashing Boxes? Well... I was on this podcast, and I think I recall the answer being uh, like Russell Crowe when he was that really angry fat truck driver movie. Um, <laughs> that's my current, not, that's not my future state, it's just my current state. All right, well, so I do recall that. Uh, we'll we'll that see if that improves your odds of getting a match here. Mm -hmm. or not. I think so, I don't yeah. Know, well, but... is, yeah, okay. No more comment right. on that one. That's good. All right, we'll, we'll come back sure. to you all in a moment. So here's how this is going to work is we have got four possible offers for Brandon. And he's gonna think about which, if any of these offers, does he wanna take with our uh, potential employers, and the employers are gonna think about that as well. So everyone has an ABCD, you're right here, if I can give you your choices. And if we can put the choices on the screen, please. And so, secretly, everybody select is this a relationship where the company wants to say, you know what, we're a good steward of the community, we want to consult with Brandon, help him find the right fit, but maybe that 
isn't the right fit for us or we need to really explore more deeply. We want to give them a freelance job, something to, you know, try the waters, get engaged with our organization uh, and, you know, fulfill some real client work. Are we going to go something that's a little bit bigger in a part-time kind of a, a environment or are we interested in exploring a full-time opportunity? So we don't have the Jeopardy music here. We've got some media in the crowd that are recording this this evening, so we, uh, we didn't have a license for that. But play Jeopardy in your mind for a moment. We're going to give you about 15 or 20 seconds. Each of you make your selections, and then we're going to reveal to the crowd and see, do we have a match? All right, does everybody want to hum? There you are. Yeah, yeah, well, I think you can sing without a license. All right, do we have any IP attorneys in the audience? All right. Is everybody ready? All right. One, two, three. Let's see what we have revealed. CBC from our audience and Brandon has a B. So we've got a match with acceleration in the middle. Uh, this is like Shark Tank. We're going to take them backstage after the show. They're going to cut their deal. Tomorrow morning at the opening uh, keynote, we're, we have a few announcements. We'll see if there's anything that happens between now and then. But um, Thank you for being our first match Absolutely. on the program. Congratulations, Brandon. You're an intern. All right. <laughs> Carly, you've, you've seen a little bit of uh, how this works now, right? Yep, I'm ready. Um, the good news is uh, your first question is the same question that Brandon got, which is tell us about a really creative way that you tried to connect with a new client. So a couple of weeks ago, this is not with a new client, but a creative way I showed up for a job was I actually put my resume on a cake and sent it to Nike a few weeks ago. Um, they were having a celebration, just do it party, and LeBron James was there, and you know, what better way to make a splash than send a cake to a party? Um, and I sent it across the country to Portland and showed up um, in their office. That is fantastic. Uh, lots of parties. How often do you have resume cake show up at the door? Any? No, no one there? I was so excited when she said that because I want to see a resume cake now. <laughs> I'll send you one next. It's a cool deal. Actually, uh, I followed that story on the internet and like apparently the DoorDash driver or whatever also is now a mini celebrity as well. Yeah, so In she's, addition to Carly. Yeah, okay. she's searching Local for a job. Local celebrity here, people. Fantastic. So maybe send your next proposal to the client printed on a cake. Just saying. All right. What, what, wonderful. All right. So, Carly, so you're an entrepreneur. You built a tech company. You exited a tech company. You work in this space. But you are not the developer yourself. Like, talk to us how, you know, how do you manage that? How do you... Make sure you're working with the right talent, you're finding the right connections, you're recommending the right things, if that's not your day-to-day. -day. Yeah, so as a non-technical person, it's important that I'm able to communicate and understand different points of view to technical people and all other people that I'm working with. Um, so that was a good learning lesson and skill built over the time of building my company. And luckily, um, Brian Marks, my co-founder, is awesome to work with. He's our CTO. Um, and the biggest thing is just being able to communicate the idea, making sure that it's documented, all the requirements, and um, you know, making sure that everybody is on the same page and having an open communication environment. Like that was really important in building our company is that everyone felt comfortable speaking their mind and speaking up when something maybe wasn't going to hit a deadline, but you know, well before the day that it was gonna happen. So I think that being a leader of a company, it's important to inspire everyone within the company um, to have that open communication line. Yeah, fantastic. So I'm interested panel, again, I'll do a 10 scale, like how important is it to know kind of the buzzwords, the acronyms, the insider language as you're talking to clients? Is, is that what closes the deal or is it more on, uh, you know, just helping them understand the, uh, the value that you can provide in a different non-technical way? Yeah, I think it's understanding the person on the other side of the table's problems and being able to speak to it, whether you know the answer and you're proficient in their language or you at least understand it. So if you're non-technical, being able to understand and listen to the technical challenges and start to equate those. And similarly, on the business side, if a technical person's explaining something, seeing that they have an appreciation for some of the business challenges that are being faced, 
uh, goes a long way. Even if they don't have them solved, like this isn't going to hit our, you know, pro forma, blah, blah, blah. But knowing that, hey, we're trying to meet a business goal makes that, that technical problem that they're talking about that much more relevant contextually. Fantastic. Anything either of you want to add? Exactly. Back Perfect. Again. And we, I, I would say that we try to be the best listeners we can be in order to um, disconnect with our client because we have some really cool human beings who are our clients. <laughs> well, awesome, awesome. All right, home stretch, two questions to go. Question number three, uh, you have a lot of expertise in kind of digital marketing, storytelling, you know, things you might think of as top of funnel as you qualify those leads and get them towards closing. Like what is key to closing or qualifying that lead so much that the sales team, like closing's a slam dunk? Yeah, so it's understanding their pain points and the emotional motivator that gets them to, you know, move to the next step. Why are they there? Um, you know, is it to build something, to build a new product, to build a new app? And, you know, are they the person that's the decision maker? Do they have a boss that is putting pressure on them? So really being able to, to ask the right questions and understand that emotion that goes behind something. Like, we all make decisions based on emotion. Um, for example, like if I was driving my car here today and I got a flat tire and I'm looking at websites of, you know, who's gonna fix my tire the quickest and I come across this website that says, um, you know, oh, we're a company that has 200 employees and a bunch of awards and all these different things. I go to the next website and it says, we'll fix your tire in 10 minutes or less. That's what I'm gonna pick because that's the pain point that I'm feeling right now to get here on time today. So really understanding your consumers pain point or whoever you're selling to and making sure that you are speaking to them in a way that matters to them and not just trying to sell yourself. Wonderful. Sounds like some alignment to what we heard a moment ago about understanding the problems, understanding customer needs. Wonderful. All right. One day we're going to have a Riot Underground podcast about what happened on stage here tonight. That's going to be part of the biopic about Carly, right? Who's going to play you? Final question. So if I had to have someone play me, I would say it would be Lady Gaga. So <laughs> I, I don't know if you guys know this, but as a child, she was bullied and people told her that she would never make it as a singer. Um, she had classmates that actually made a Facebook group um, and the title was uh, You'll Never Be Famous. And she continued to chase her dreams after everyone doubted her and stuff. So I am the type of person that's gonna continue to ch chase my dreams and you know get the dream job gaga fans absolutely all right wonderful okay we hear that theme music again a little jeopardy or uh, maybe uh you know what's the game share your choice we want no whammies here right we want matches make your selections we'll draw this pause out for a dramatic effect we don't have a commercial break like you would have on regular television so but that's good, we can finish a little faster. Everybody ready? All right, let's go to the panel for where are you at? A, B, Bab. Got a B, A, B, and Carly? Uh, I'm open to all options. All options, wonderful. All right, all right. So we've got, once again, acceleration with the perfect match, all three, uh, Feel free to reach out to Carly afterwards. Thanks for joining us in this, uh, this little experiment. As I said, tomorrow at the opening keynote, uh, we'll say a few words about kind of uh, what we learned uh, during the course of the evening. This evening, um, I've got just a couple of quick closeout remarks to make, but first, let's give a round of applause for our uh, contestants and their bravery this evening. Really exciting. So, we got one last thing that we're gonna work on today as we, uh, we give them a thank you, which is, we're getting ready to go down and support a bunch of entrepreneurs downstairs on the mezzanine level, and I'll give you specific directions there. I've also got a code for everybody who's trying to win prizes for all things open. Hang with me for about three more slides, and I'll give you the code. Uh, I think we have a $250 Amazon gift card at stake for somebody in the audience right now. Uh, but a lot more than $250. Uh, we've got our inaugural, what we're calling Larry Bucks. So I mentioned at the beginning, I was gonna uh, talk for a few moments about Larry Stefan, who is one of the co-founders of Riot. Larry had a vision uh, years before most people did in this region that there was entrepreneurial potential in the triangle. 
For those who happen to be from this area, you may be familiar with a co-working space called American Underground over in Durham. Larry was the very first tenant in American Underground. He started a gaming incubator called Joystick Labs with some other collaborators. And he had a vision that if we could provide the kinds of resources that accelerator programs, other things that you were familiar with in, in Silicon Valley and in a few other hot spots around the world, uh, had that this area could really thrive. And, uh, and, and through Riot, we've provided a lot of services and I'm, I'm happy with, with how we've grown. grown. Unfortunately, Larry, uh, we lost Larry a few year, years ago, but we wanted to memorialize him here this evening uh, because he really laid a foundation, not just of supporting entrepreneurship, but he had a real passion for you know, creative engagement of folks that maybe weren't traditional profile tech engineers or entrepreneurs or software developers. How do we get into underserved communities? How do we help people that are getting out of the justice system? How do we help folks in, uh, you know, in low income neighborhoods or folks that couldn't afford to go to college, other kinds of things? And so really the, the Riot Mission has expanded over the years and we've worked in more rural communities. We've worked in, in low income areas. And so this evening as a little bit of a tribute to Larry, we're excited to say, you know, through the years, the Riot Accelerator program ha has worked with many, many companies. We're in our 13th cohort of this program. We're now operating in four cities. I can announce actually officially that uh, in 2023, we're gonna be running in Cary, North Carolina, which is a new city uh, for us right, right here in the Triangle. Um, we're already operating up in Virginia, out in Wilson, North Carolina, here in the Triangle. Um, and, uh, and we have some discussions in some other spots, but this is a free program. We don't take any ownership or equity or IP from these companies. The founders do hard work. They should own the results of that work. Uh, if you want to get involved, we've, you can find information on riot.org. You can talk to Rachel Newberry, who I'm going to pick on in the crowd, who's uh, here waving her hand at us. Um, but but uh, we're, we're interested in, in mentors and volunteers. We're also interested in companies that have technology platforms that startups can build their, their companies on top of. So if you're working at a large cloud company or an analytics company or a manufacturer uh, like DNA Group, who's our sponsor this evening and others, we'd love to get you involved in this program. During COVID, we had a whole lot of companies that we worked with that didn't get a traditional public pitch event. One of the things that's really fun at Riot is, you know, we get people up on a stage at, at Lincoln Theater, Rock and Roll Club, at Marbles uh, Children's Museum. You know, we find really cool venues, Durham Bowl Stadium, other kinds of places where they can, you know, make their pitch, have their real kind of Shark Tank moment. Pandemic shut that down because nobody wants to sit online and watch a bunch of people pitch on Zoom, right? So tonight, We've got a bunch of our alumni downstairs on the mezzanine right now showing off their company, showing off their technology, and every company that's participating has got a manila envelope taped to the front of their table. And the, uh, oops, we'll pull that slide up. Um, and the idea is everyone that goes downstairs, we're gonna give you some of those Larry bucks that you saw on the screen. And you're, the, the startups, what we're trying to teach them tonight is how do you leverage a, a, an event like this? There's people coming around, they're strangers, you don't know who they are, you only have a moment, it's loud, it's chaotic, uh, people are drinking beer, who knows if they're paying attention. How do you get their attention? How do you give that elevator pitch? How do you get someone excited about your company? And they're vying for your investor dollars. And so if you like what you see, you see something interesting, stuff that money into their envelope, we're gonna count it all up tonight. Tomorrow morning we're gonna announce uh, what startup uh, won this evening's competition, but my call to action for you is not just to participate and engage in that, which should be a lot of fun, but also everyone in here find some way to help one of these companies. Is there an introduction that you can make for them? Is there you know, something about what they're doing that kind of strikes a nerve that you can say, you know what, maybe you should think about this, or I can introduce you to this person. Maybe. Uh, you could be a pilot customer for them. Maybe you have you know, a technology solution or some business expertise, something that you could, you could lend to them or, or to somebody, uh, you know, a future person in the program. So uh, let's, let's form a community this evening in the same way that Todd Lewis and the, American, the, the amazing All Things Open team has done over the last 10 years, uh, kind of embrace this entrepreneurship. Uh, at the same time, have a good time. At six o'clock, we're rolling out, I think, three kegs and a whole bunch of food, and it's 5.54 now. So I'm gonna give a final thank you to 
uh, our startups for being here. Let's go spend some money. Thank you, Riot sponsors. Thank you to the audience for being here, for participating, and for being part of this community. So, thank you.